All right, uh, cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for ScaleCon. Um, Jonathan, Mike, Jane, everyone, and Duncan, and so forth. It's really a nice privilege to be able to speak here. Um, I've, <laughs> I've really enjoyed the ScaleCons from the last previous two years. Um, it's such a nice mix for me. Uh, the, the whole developer group bringing together like Rubyists, Pythonists, and Java people, louder. everyone. PHP. Speak louder. PHP, hello? Okay, is it better? Yes, better. Okay, cool. I'll try to keep it there, but <laughs> so just tell me when I'm off. Okay, um, so I'm going to get started. Uh, who here knows Yappy Chef? Excellent. So I don't have to, to explain too much, but I'll, I'll start with the from the beginning. Um, so this is where Yappy Chef started in Andrew and Shane's Lounge in 2006. Um, and it started with a dream of bringing quality kitchen tools to South Africa and to people's homes um, to kind of nurture that kitchen culture. And we often think of ourselves as a customer service company that happens to sell kitchen tools. We, we joke insi inside that we're a tech company that happens to sell kitchen tools as well because we enjoy <laughs> building cool stuff. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Dion. Uh, I've worked with Andrew for about the last 14 years, um, but I joined Yapishev three years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm just a sucker for programming languages, programming in general, concepts, techniques. Um, I get drawn into all the shiny stuff. Uh, and like, so Andrew has a hard time keeping me focused. <laughs> all right, um, I'd like to share the purpose of this talk is Really, just have everyone relax. This is not a best practice talk. I'm not like I'm not saying this is the best way of doing things. We just, I just want to share the story. And, um, I want to share the learnings that we've found uh, and what kind of works for us. Um, and so, yeah. So I'm going to start a little bit about where um, we started to where we where we are now and kind of the direction we want to go into, kind of what our focus are um, and just explain the stack. I, I'm a little bit more tech focused, uh, um, but I'm not very numbers focused. So there's no like big numbers of like 10 orders and 3,000 orders or 10 million. Um, yeah, so who here doesn't know what LAMP is? <coughs> Excellent. So I don't have to explain that too much. Um, so we built this like years ago. I, I built the base system probably Hello? Uh, yeah. I bought the base system about probably 10 years ago and it's been uh, e just evolving ever since. It's a, it's a monolith kind of app. Um, but what's very interesting is that it's still going solo, like as a single service, you know, single server, um, which like to me is quite an interesting thing. We, we are moving very much towards being able to scale, putting ourselves into that position, but we are trying very hard not to scale unless we actually need to like throw hardware at the problem. We're trying to um, define the bottlenecks before we just go crazy. Um, because <laughs> I found that as soon as you start scaling, you need to start really scaling. Uh, so it's <laughs> quite interesting. Um, so then I'd like to talk a little bit. We've So we've got this whole PHP monolith, but we, what we try and do is we try and have um, external service providers for multiple things, like, like uh, storing, uh, using CDNs like the S3. Um, we try uh, off offload uh, the customer service stuff like um, the call desk things to desk, um, accounting to like zero. Um, and then we integrate with career companies. But those, those things I'm not going to show on these slides. I just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, so then the first thing we kind of added on, which was quite interesting, we, the first search that we used to have on the site was a Google search, like, you know, the typical uh, interesting results. Um, we didn't enjoy, enjoy that because of the, um, that we couldn't customize it enough. Uh, so we moved over to Nextopia after that, which was an international service that you could just dump your CSV file at them every night and then they'd, they'd like basically perform searches for you and we'd just redirect through there. We could templatize that and make it look nice. Um, but we didn't enjoy the, the slow international turnaround time. Um, so what we did was the next part, we implemented PHP Lucene. Uh, anybody, everybody, anybody here mm, familiar with PHP Lucene at all? We found, we found that Particularly, uh, slowed was a bit of a memory hog. Uh, it got to a point where it actually couldn't index all our products, um, which is a bit of a problem. 
Um, uh, so eventually we settled on solar, which we're running on the box. And um, what I really enjoyed about it was it's fast uh, and it gives us, gives us flexibility in the future because we can cl uh, cluster it, we can go crazy. Uh, we can also customize whatever parts of it we like um, and really works very well for us. Right, so moving forward. Interestingly, um, someone mentioned that yesterday, I can't remember who, who about like building your website and then you've got your admin side like right there. It was on the, um, yeah, anyway, and they're all part of the same system. We've got kind of that, that, that problem in the sense that we, our whole admin back end and the front end is the same thing. So we, we really want to uh, move that off. We've also happened to be in Westlake, which is like rivals Kirstenbosch for the worst internet connectivity in Cape Town, um, which is fantastic. <laughs> Um, so we would really ideally like to um, move that in-house into the actual office space, just the admin side of things, um, so that our warehouse doesn't grind to a halt every time um, Telcom decides to have a disruption. Um, and also, I, I, while I'm uh, quite well versed in PHP, I'm, I'm, it's not really my language of choice uh, for various reasons, um, but I. <laughs> Very obvious, but anyway. So we were, so we were wondering. I was wondering, like, what's the what's the answer? What, where, how do I move forward? So the obvious answer was. <laughs> well, my my background is very very heavily entrenched in Java. I spent um, years uh, in that space. Um, where, uh, so I, I was. I was a big fan of JBoss, JPA. Um, I came along before, after EJB1 and EJB2, so I managed to skip the XML pain. Um, so EJB3 was kind of like my, I was a bit of a fanboy. So I spent about six months building uh, our warehouse system in, jo in uh, Java EE, the whole stack, you know, JMS, the whole thing. Um, and I was really starting to get bogged down, but uh, that that was kind of what I was enjoying, until one day um, I realized I watched a video by Rich Hickey, uh called "Simple Made Easy." I've got a link in the next slide, um, and that basically whacked me in the head a bit, um, and I realized that I was in a bit of trouble. Uh, <laughs> this this wasn't going to work. I, I spent about 15 minutes. Like compiling my code, shutting down JBoss, restarting things, deploying things. I, I could have automated it all, but like, eh, um, it's it's still not. It wasn't it wasn't fun. It started getting really painful. Um, so in the, in this talk, he um, really talks about some interesting things about like peer functions, which I'll talk about a little bit later again. Um, but at the same time, there was a bit of a convergence of a couple of things. So I, I'm, I started seeing the Ruby guys and the Python guys in Cape Town, really, really seeing just how much, um, how much like faster they can get to do stuff. So they have a much quicker turnaround time. They can interact with the tools much nicer. Like I, I was feeling like, wow, I'm really, um, I'm really not gaining from this whole Java thing. Um, but, and then also I found that, uh, I don't know, who knows about the 12-factor app? A couple of you guys. So I, I, found, I found that site and I started internalizing the 12-factor app and the couple of um, things that they have on there. Um, and Rich also spoke a bit about concurrency and why it's so hard and what we should actually be doing to fix it. Um, which you can go watch the talk, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, another thing that's been mentioned twice yesterday, at least, uh, by, by Nicholas and Chris was the microservices thing by uh, Martin Fowler, which he, he summarized very nicely um, just the trend that everyone's kind of heading towards. I still have to kind of internalize a couple of the concepts, but um, it's, it's definitely um, making life a lot easier. Um, another thing I want to mention on the 12-factor app is that I find that it's, it's a couple of simple concepts. I mean, it's very basic stuff like send your send your uh, logging to standard out and don't try and like do stuff with it with it in your app um, and like use ports and so forth I, I still I find that you have to actually sit and think about it for a while for, for each one to really understand it and um, and like put it as part of your kind of thing uh, you could say you have to grok it um, if that's the right pronunciation grok um, <laughs> I'm no Martian, so it's fine. 
Um, the one thing that I that like I'm struggling with specifically is the is twelve factor apps talk about you have to you should use all your services as ports. I'm a big fan of mes message queues, which to me does kind of the same thing. So um, that's still something I'm exploring. Right. So the one thing that came out of the Simple Made Easy talk was Rich was saying that right after this talk, you better in implement message queues. Like so, I did. Right. Um, I picked Me Rabbit and Q because the thing just worked. I didn't have to go crazy setting all sorts of stuff up. Um, so now I had this. I was very proud. Uh, but we kind of <laughs> lacked something. It was still just a lamp. Uh, it, there was no PHP for me. I had no way of actually consuming off the queues uh, <laughs> properly. You could you could probably have a run running, run, no, long running uh, PHP process, but that would suck. Um, so, um, because Richicky was affiliated, kind of, well, he built Clojure, um, I, I decided to look into it because of the underlying philosophies regarding concurrency, regarding simplicity. Um, and so, I, I built a little Clojure server that sits on our web server, and all that does is it sits and consumes of queues. Now, I, I'm a big fan of migration paths so instead of trying to build version 2 of anything because you have a lot of, there's a lot of business logic, a lot of decisions that have been already made um, that you can't just like port in one go. So um, this CLJ server would literally um, read off a queue and most of the time it would call back a PHP file which does some work and gets on with life. Uh, it can respond to queues que if you do RPC messages. Um, and so forth. It can also do stuff transparently in Clojure instead. So what's interesting about that is that as we shard our, our monolithic PHP app into queue consumers, we can re replace those with Clojure-based um, functions. Uh, and the app is going to be no, none the wiser entirely. So it gives us a nice way of chomping down bit by bit as we need to um, over to Clojure, which is my mm, final end goal one day. Okay, so we still had this problem, right? We had this dividing line about like of the internet and our warehouse, which would go up and down as it pleased, and usually in the worst possible time for a while. Um, so the first thing we did, I built a, I built a little in our server, also in Clojure. Um, I, I, I toyed a little bit with stuff like a mutant to stick it onto JBoss and found out that actually JBoss is doing nothing, uh, for me anyway. Um, and so uh, I've eventually settled now with a little library called HTTP Kit. Um, I'm probably going to put Nginx in front of that at some point when we, when we need to serve up static content and stuff. Um, but this houses basically all the warehouse logic, which, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but what my, my final dream is to have all of the, all of the admins, admin functionality on this side of the line. So that when things go down, when things go funny, we, we are we are able to not grind to halt. Um, and all the reporting and whatever else. Okay, then we need a, new, a way to communicate because like this little process on its own is kind of pointless. Um, so I implemented another uh, another Rabbit MQ and um, connected it up with a, with a federation. What's very interesting about this, uh, who's heard of federated queues on Rabbit MQ? Who's heard of Rabbit MQ? Who uses it in production? Huh, a couple of people, I like that. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so the fe federated queues. What they do is they connect up. They connect up two queues. One from one on your local, one on your on your, on your server. And you can literally just say this exchange. Any messages it gets, if the other server is interested in that, route that down. Now, what's cool is that if the internet goes down, those messages just queue, right? And then when the internet goes back up, those messages go through, um, and then they get onto the other side. And it's a two-way kind of communication. So. It's a very nice, easy way of of talking between the service, servers without them even knowing that they that they are necessarily across the line at all. So, what uh, one of the kind of use cases that I use quite often is that my uh, the web server knows how to send mail, like it uses um, Mandrel to send tons of emails. So, and that's already set up now. Instead of trying to send mail from my local machine and hoping it works, uh, I just Put a, put a message on the queue and the thing sends it up to the web server and it gets sent, which is a small thing, but it's quite nice. And there's a whole bunch of um, things around that. 
so the next thing is that all our all our warehouse tablets. So we have we have um, like I'd say 15 or five inch tablets and about hmm, uh, probably about 10 or 20 um, 10 inch Android tablets that all connect to RabbitMQ directly. With that's all written in Java because um, because while I would like to write an enclosure, uh, it's a little slow. So. Um, and that just talks to the queue. It actually doesn't know that there's a server locally at all. Uh, it just happens to be processing the messages locally. So, and that works really, really nicely. Um, uh, then, I'd like to like digress a little bit. So, what the what these Android tablets do is, in the uh, when the stock hits the warehouse, the the guys scan it in with um, little. Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth scanners and whatever. They scan it in. This sends messages to this in our server through the Rabbit queue. Um, they put it on the trolleys. That goes into the warehouse. Um, when orders are placed and are ready to go out, um, the guys have little uh, tablets on their on their wrists with little Bluetooth scanners. It tells them, okay, go to this aisle, go take this thing, or put it on your trolley, take that thing. It like puts 50 orders together onto a trolley if it needs to, uh, and tells them, okay, put those over there. And so this thing, this in our server, um, manages all of that kind of state. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, a couple of things that's not in this picture is uh, we use memcached on the web server um, for various caching things. Um, we use Redis on the in our server just locally uh, for m primarily just for session for session stories because what we do is that the in our server is a complete is a big monolithic app at the moment. Well, I'd like to split that apart, but I'm still thinking of how to do that properly. Um, and so we, we bring this down, but then the, the in-memory state of the sessions are gone. So um, when I re when I bring up another version, I just use Redis for this for the session store. Uh, I also have my SQL in both boxes. Um, that's I didn't think those things needed to be in the picture. It's just too complex. Um, I'd also like to share an interesting little story of uh, <laughs> part of the description was what failed horribly. So um, the, the, one, the, one <laughs> the one deployment I did um, had, had a bit of a problem where it ended up sending 42 Nespresso machine to someone in Durban where it was supposed to send one. <laughs> This is a particularly interesting problem because if any, anybody who knows me knows that I, I have a particularly harsh take on TDD. Um, so y uh, you know that I don't, I don't do TDD unless I absolutely like have to. Um, so, so you might say like, hey, why don't you should have written test. The thing is, this particular piece of functionality I, I had written per perfect tests for. <laughs> and it happened to be an integration problem. Anyway, <laughs> so it's a little bit ironic. Um, but yeah, so we, we fixed that up and it was inter it was cool. Um, another interesting thing is that the, um, because because of closure, I'm able to um, connect straight to the running live environment on on the warehouse server and even on the closure server on our web server, um, and I'm able I'm able to push functionality functions directly into the running live state, um, which a lot of people will get the uh, get a bit nervous about. Um, but it's really been incredibly empowering for me because um, a lot of people will come straight to me like, hey, this item, when I scan it, it's, it's broken. Like, it's not going onto my trolley or this thing isn't there for whatever reason. Now there's no, or there's not enough reports or whatever the reason may be. So I can, I can ripple straight into the, the running box and like there might not be enough logging or whatever. I push a function that has more logging. I say, okay, try it again. They beep, okay, yeah, that still breaks, but now I've got logging. So I go, okay, there's the problem. Push the function, okay, cool, works, okay. Off with your day. I didn't have to recreate it on my dev environment. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I go push the code and it gets auto deployed. So it's a little bit backwards, um, but it works quite well. Um, of course, on our, in our case, like uh, I'm lucky. Um, my customers are literally like 20 people, maybe. Uh, <laughs> if the whole thing dies, uh, they're affected for maybe like a half an hour. So it's not a big deal. Um, and I can generally fix it quite quickly. Another thing that uh, that really enables me, um, and I'd like to talk about that a bit, is peer functions. Um, with Clojure, you, you really try and build peer functions. It's very similar to Haskell thing, it's just, just a bit more relaxed. Um, so if you're building peer functions, it means that you can 
really run stuff on the REPL and you know that it's not going to have side effects. So you can test it. You can like go, hey, if I give it these these inputs like I'm trying to do on uh, on my actual thing, like what is the output and don't stuff around with the database kind of thing. So and that's taken me a, a while of like thinking about because um, you'd say like, well, I can't write the database. What now? But you can pass the database value in because it's in a transaction and you can respond with a list of things to do. So you can say, okay, well, um, looking at the database, you should be um, moving this thing to there, moving that thing to there, updating that user, doing this thing with a session, um, uh, sending an email or sending another two messages or whatever, and have those a list of things to do afterwards. Now that system at the end that can take that can then do the side effects separately. And that's super handy um, and lets me like be able to call something and say, okay, what are you going to do? And they go, huh, that's not ideal. Um, yeah. So just quickly about uh, the learnings from from this uh, setup. Message queues, use them. <laughs> if there's one thing you take from the talk, like Richie says, get use message queues. Uh, well, or don't, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, but they really let you let you decouple things. You don't have to think about. You have to like you're forced to pull things apart and um, think, okay, I'm just doing this piece of functionality. I don't want to be doing this other thing. I need to just hand it off to someone else and have them worry about it whenever they want. And what's really particularly nice for me, and this is kind of my thinking, again, not against, but versus uh, using straight ports, is that even if it doesn't happen right now, um, it can happen later on down the line if you, um, because it really encourages asynchronicity. So um, it can happen down the line, no one cares. Um, and if the, th the service is not online, if there's nothing to consume that, that message, is, it can sit there. Um, and that's really, really been super handy. Um, it also lets you flatten your hierarchy quite a bit so you don't have to drill in like 3,000 functions in order to get to your piece of functionality that's now broken. Um, you can just, it's just like a consumer function that does like a couple of things and heads off, sends some messages, does other things. It also lets you build language agnostic code. So if someone comes along tomorrow and says, hey, cool, I've written this Ruby thing that does exactly what you want, I can go, okay, cool, connect it to a queue, and I can use it. I don't have to worry about anything else except getting, keeping it running and actually consuming, uh, that which, would, which is quite handy. <laughs> um, and it also gives us, like I've mentioned before, a clean and eventual migration path. So um, we can build stuff piece by piece by piece and um, migrate to closure. Again, microservices, um, compose simple services. You, wa you want to have your services do one thing and do one thing very well. Uh, and then you want to compose it. So you try and pull apart your, your, your apps into a simple as possible. Ah, can everybody hear me okay? Um, and then compose them back together again. And that goes for all the way down to functions as well. Um, but yeah, just try to do that. That's super handy for us. Um, um, and it makes it easily replaceable with another language and with another function for that another person's built if it doesn't work properly. And then again, I'll mention don't scale unless you have to. Like, yes, develops are expensive. Hardware gets expensive exponentially if you it really, it's really sucking. Um, but um, so I, I always like to take the t take the stance that just throwing hardware isn't necessarily the answer. S a lot of the times it is, um, but uh, like I like to actually look at it and say yes or no. Um, that's the way you to go. And love peer functions. Uh, it doesn't really fit into the rest of the slides so much, but um, peer functions really let you um, have a lot of leverage on reasoning about your about your code. If you have values in, you get a value out. If you have the same values one day or three years from now and it's the same function, you'll always get the same result regardless of anything because it has a peer function should have zero side effects. Uh, and that lets you reason about your code without having to worry about where is it sitting, what um, class, what state you're dealing with, anything. It's f really, really nice. And peer functions are particularly testable. So in the REPL, in unit tests, if you that way inclined, um, it's great. A bit of a punt. 
Um, Rob Satterford and I, we, we, we head up the Closure User Group in Cape Town. Here's some links for you to follow. Um, we we having a bit of a duel there, so come join us. And thank you. Cool. Thanks, Dion. Any questions? I know somebody was asking on Twitter for hints about the Easter competition, <laughs> but I guess that's related to winning free stuff on uh, Twitter on Yuppie Chef rather than technology. To be honest, I don't even know the answers. <laughs> I suck at finding them. <laughs> Any questions? Other back. Hi. Um, you may have mentioned this already, sorry, I didn't catch every single word. I just want to know what kind of health monitoring tools do you use and, and logging tools? So if there's a problem on your site, how do you go about sort of debugging this? That's a good question. Um, we, we used to use, a while ago, we used to use uh, Graphite uh, quite extensively. Um, but we've been exper experimenting with Gibana as well, and that's working quite well with us oh, for us, um, just to store our logs and, and kind of measure when there's problems and stuff. So that so that's kind of what we're using now. Um, we've also tried, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, Librato as well, but that, that wasn't quite customizable enough for us. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? No, cool. All right, let's thank Dion.